All right, so I got a half hour starting at 35 after. So this talk is um, natural history to the glory of God. And first, I wanted to define terms. Anytime you use some words that aren't super familiar, wanted to define them. Um, first, natural history. Um, at New St. Andrews, actually my title is Senior Fellow of Natural History. Translation, biology professor. So natural history um, more or less overlaps generally with biology, but at getting a definition online, uh, one of the definitions was a scientific study of animals and plants, especially as concerned with observation rather than experiment, okay? So it's something that lay people can do. It's the kind of science that you can do just right looking out your back window at your bird feeder. It's not, there's not this, um, we try not to, in natural history, you don't try to add your, it's not what the what emotions were evoked inside your bosom as you beheld the creature. You're not analyzing yourself, you're looking at the creature. Uh, natural history had its heyday back in the 1800s. A lot of clergy on their free time, when they maybe should have been pastoring their flock, were out there um, observing nature. And uh, you may have heard of um, uh, Gilbert White's uh, Natural History of Selborne, who he was a pastor in England, and he, that's a classic book. But it's, it's just observing and really looking at the details of, of the world around us. We've somehow relegated that to biologists, uh, you know, these eggheads, these geeks. But it doesn't have to be. <clears throat> it doesn't have to be exper experimental. It can just be looking closely at uh, creatures, plants, whatever. And is presented in popular rather than academic form. I think there's been more and more a disconnect between uh, biology. So many of the biologists, they've taken over and then they've just sort of uh, inundated that whole discipline with all of these technical terms. You know, and I speak that language, but I think it's sad because it's, it's made, made uh, the natural world somewhat inaccessible. It's not really inaccessible, it's right outside. But it sort of is viewed as inaccessible because, well, that's biology territory. I can't learn that. All these big words, like my favorite one is uh, metathoracic saltatorial appendages. I was in entomology. And um, translation is big jumping hind legs. <laughs> Scientists like big words. You know, and it makes them feel smarter, and it makes them feel like they're this this little um, arcane um, group that is way above everybody else. But it doesn't have to be. Well, glory, one definition, just a secular definition, is praise, worship, and thanksgiving offered to a deity. I'm putting, well, obviously there's only one God, Father of um, our Lord Jesus Christ, the father of uh, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, um, the triune God. And so the whole point is to try to, um, my, my goal is to cultivate a deep appreciation for the natural world. I'm at New St. Andrews. There is no biology major. And so all of the students that I get, my hope is that even if they're going to become an entrepreneur or a, um, a small business owner or a realtor or an engineer or whatever, I want them to just have a deep appreciation for the natural world and not feel like it's just the, the general backdrop or the stage that God has made and we just kind of are focused in our own little world, doing our own little thing, and we just see the natural world as sort of this impressionistic blur. 
the green is just, to the layperson, the green is just shrubbery. It's all blotchy and green, and we don't look at the, the, the detail, the sculpture, the architecture. And I just want the common lay, the non-scientist to just absorb it and enjoy it and, and lead them and have that usher them into praise and worship and thanksgiving. But these have been separated for so long. I think we need to bring it back uh, because we've been taught evolution. For, even if we don't believe it, we've been taught that that's the realm of the secularists. No, it's, this is my father's world. So in the first movie, if you've seen Ride in the Dance Earth, I talk about um, Michelangelo. And um, basically, if you wanted, uh, I said that biology or natural history is theology because theology is a study of God. And of course, we normally think of a study of God um, through um, the revealed word, through special revelation. But... Uh, and that obviously is primary. That's how he's revealed himself. We know his moral character, uh, his redemptive character, all of the many attributes we've learned from the scriptures. But also in Romans 1.20, it says, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from your Bible? No. It says, being understood from what has been made. So to a big part of learning who God is, not just his moral character, but his creative character, his, his genius, his architectural engineering. It's not just good architecture. You look at animals and plants, amazing architecture. We just go, oh, a palm tree. What do you mean just a palm tree? Well, because they're common. It's just a palm tree. What does that have to do with anything? It is amazing architecture. And we're amazed going to a cathedral in Europe and go, that's architecture. That's nothing. A weed in your backyard is better architecture. Okay, so it's, um, and to study Michelangelo you would want to study everything that he wrote and made. So it's the same with God. You want to study everything he wrote and made. Now, you don't have to be a biologist. I'm not, I'm not trying to bind your conscience or anything like that. As my brother likes to say, it's a get to, not a got to. We get to look at God's glory. So what I want to do here is just hop, skip, and jump through a couple things. Uh, I'm going to do one fungus. I'm going to do one lizard and one mollusk. And just a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of what's out there. But I, there's what biologists call charismatic megafauna. You know what a charismatic megafauna is? Charismatic megafauna is the humpback whale breaching out of this. Everybody likes the charismatic megafauna. The bigger, the better. Big whales, big lions, big elephants. We want big. And then we'll say, okay, I'll sit up and listen. I'll sit up and watch if it's big. But I like uncharismatic microfauna <laughs> and microflora. I like little things that everybody doesn't see. And I'll say, that is just as incredible. Just as incredible. It's just you need to have somebody like a geek to unveil it. And that's my job, is to take something very tiny and go, this is cool. Look, and I'm not even going to use big words. Well, no. I'll try to minimize the big words. Or if I use a big word, I'm going to define the big word. So biblical precedent, I'm going to run through these real quick because I want to get on to the critters. 
Um, biblical precedent for natural history, dominion mandate, Genesis 128. Um, oh, where's my Bible? Genesis 128. And God blessed them. God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heaven, over every living thing that moves on the earth. You know, one of the first commandments is global wildlife management. That's what it is. Global wildlife management and domestic life management, every kind of life management. That's what the dominion mandate is. Of course, it involves more than that because you have a lot of... Uh, inanimate matter to needed to manage the animate matter but uh this is what the dominion mandate is global wild and domestic life management um so we need to know our charges if we are to have dominion over them we need to know something about them it's really bad business to not know your client i mean if you don't know your clients that's bad business and we're given dominion over everything. Do we know them? We need to. Dis Another thing, I love this passage in 1 Kings. Um, 1 Kings, when I stumbled upon it the first time, I was like, this is cool. King Solomon was the first biology teacher. It says, Solomon, he spoke of trees. From the cedar that is in Lebanon to the hyssop that grows out of the wall, he spoke also of beasts and birds and reptiles and fish. Yes! That's Solomon talking about biology. It wasn't just moral lessons, although it included that. We'd normally think, oh, he only used animals just to teach some kind of moral principle. No, we didn't. He taught about the natural history of these things. He included you know, go to the ant, sluggard, and that sort of stuff. But it was more than that. Psalm 104 it dis displays his care over his creatures. I don't have time, but you could preach several sermons out of Psalm 104 on uh, just how he cares for the beasts of the field, both the wild and domestic. And then he also talks about man, uh, plants for man to cultivate and bread to strengthen his heart and wine to gladden his heart, and oil to make his face shine, and all of it is from the biological world. Everything we eat, everything that we drink, is from the biological world, okay? Except water, but that's from God, too. Everything's from God. Isn't that amazing? And um, so read Psalm 104 again and again and again. Psalm 111, greater the works of the Lord studied by all who have pleasure in them. It's not a get to, it's a got to. I'm sorry, it's not a got to, it's a get to. Okay? Uh, studied by all who have pleasure in them. So if you don't have pleasure in them, no, no guilt trip. Okay? If you are into being inside, flat floors, filtered air, fluorescent lighting, you're going to knock yourself out. But for those who have pleasure in the heat and humidity and bugs and never mind. We do live in a fallen world. Display models of good and bad character like go to the ant um, and then the, don't be like the mule in Psalm 32 uh, who must be steered by bit and bridle. So there's, there's models for that. Display his might in creating various creatures to humble Job. I mean, you think of, you know the book of Job, where God basically gives, gives, Satan, open, gives, gives Satan the open season on Job. And, and at the end, you're thinking that God should just come up with a pretty heavy theological justification for why he let that happen. And what does God do at the end? He just starts talking about his creatures why can bad things happen to good people I made the ostrich 
I made the donkey, the wild donkey, and I made the horse, and I made the, the, the ostrich that laughs at the horse when it comes to speed. And I made, oh, and then he ends with the grand finale of Behemoth and Leviathan. He says, that's why bad things can happen to good people. Because you see these amazing creatures I made? And you go, what? What does that have to do with anything? Because God is God. And it's, you know, that's why. And, and at the end of Job, <clears throat> after he, God gives him a powerful natural history lesson, Job just says, I heard, I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. And that's his response after God's told him about all of his beasts. <laughs> hmm. Well, on to critters. Or not critters. Here's a fungus. Bird's nest. Anybody seen a bird's nest fungus? All right. Here, you have to slow down. You have to look small. You have to look down. They're little, little tiny cups. And, of course, you know why it's called a bird's nest fungus. It's little cups with little discs in them. And it's very easy to overlook. We, we, we notice mushrooms. But we don't notice things smaller than that. And they're really cool. They're actually really pretty if you get up close. Uh, and the, little cu the discs inside them are little packages, they look like tiddlywinks, and they, they're little packages of spores, fungal spores. The idea is those spores can get out of those packages and then start new bird's, bird's nest fungus. These are amazing little things because um, the little cups are splash cups and the drop of raindrop can hit the cup and it splashes those little discs out. <clears throat> you go, well, okay, great. And the, but, but the engineering there. Now, some species of birds, now there's a lot of different species, and some are very delicately attached to the bottom of the cup, but when the water hits them, they get splashed out, ripped out, and there's this little purse. You see that's labeled purse? It's a very, very delicate sleeve in the center picture. The disc gets splashed out, and the middle piece is sort of hooked, and it yanks on the middle piece when it gets splashed out and rips the purse open. And when the purse gets ripped open, this little tiny cord is unleashed. Okay? This little tiny cord gets, uh, it's called a funicular cord. We just call it, funi funiculus just means little rope in Latin. And a little cord comes trailing out. And at the end of that cord, is a thing called hapron, but just call it a sticky end. It's just a sticky end of the cord. And this cool little thing gets splashed out. The steep walls of the cup cause it to get splashed up sometimes two, three feet in the air. And the cup is only a couple, three millimeters wide. And it gets splashed up two, three feet in the air. And if it's lucky enough, it might be under a bush or something that the disc goes over the twig and then when it goes over the twig, it starts to fall to the earth, and then that sticky end gets caught on the branch. And then when it gets stuck on the branch, it, that disc falls down and goes... <whistles> and wraps around the branch like a tether ball on a pole. And then that little thing rips open and spores trickle out. Now, a lot of them just splash out and land on the ground. That's no problem. They get, the spores get un, ripped open. And, but it's just cool that God just adds these little, little cool things on these things that real uh, observant, obsessive types discover. Most people would never discover that unless they're really looking close. But God made all kinds of people. Some people he men, made to go down the trail fast and they would never see this ever they could be walking past them all their life and never see them not big deal 
not a problem. But there are some people that like to look at things. Kids especially. You know, kids out there, go for it. Look at things. You might grow out of it, that's fine. You might, you know, a biologist is somebody that just never grew out of it. But if you grow out of it, that is just fine. Isn't that amazing? Another thing I wanted to look at is chameleons. Uh, there's a lot of cool things about chameleons. They have a laterally flattened body, weird feet with um, their digits bundled in twos and threes, and they grab branches. Instead of four and one, it's two and three. And they grab their branches. They have a independently movable eyes with muffler-like eyelids and one eye can be looking that way and one eye that way and it's just crazy they're amazing every feature of them is amazing but what I want to look at is their projectile tongue we just go yeah they have cool tongues they just kind of go zoom okay great you just kind of look at them and go they got a cool tongue wow I can do that mm. Can you do that with your body length? You know. Um, so this tongue is an amazing piece of engineering. And so I thought I'd look at the, some of the details here. The projectile tongue. Now, <clears throat> there's a lot of big words here. So I'll just use other words instead. Um, let's see, I don't have any prop, but if you looked at that tongue there, you can see um, the tongue is basically like a big sock that's bunched up on a stiff rod. That stiff rod there is in blue called the entoglossal process. You don't see the tongue on it up there um, in that upper uh, left hand corner you don't see the tongue but on the right upper right you can see the tongue is sort of like a big sock on top of this stiff rod it's all bunched up and it's fleshy and that rod that it's on is a very it's very slippery and the there's an accelerator muscle that's inside the tongue it's a circular muscle that's wrapped around that rod. And when it wants to launch, it just, that muscle just pinches that rod. And since that rod is tapered, when that pinches, it just goes boom like that and just slips off there and accelerates. So it's, it's kind of like, uh, like snapping your finger on, a, on something slippery and just like that. And when it accelerates, it takes that whole fleshy blob at the end of the tongue, just a very fleshy uh, mucus covered tongue, and it just goes zinging out. And you can see at the bottom picture that you can see the accelerator muscles already done its job and it just gets thrown out by inertia. And then this blob like fleshy part just hits the insect and just like a squishy boxing glove and just bam, it hits the insect and wraps around the insect, envelops the insect. And then how do you get it back? You know, the tongue's just dangling down. <clears throat> the accelerator muscle got it out there, but you gotta have a bunch of other muscles that pull it back on. So there's these longitudinal muscles that it's like haul it in, haul it in and pull that tongue back onto the rod and then once it, once it bunches that onto the rod, then it can pull back into the mouth. Notice back in the back of the mouth, there's this whole hinge thing. So you've got all these muscles that, um, let's see, there's these muscles at the bottom of the jaw that pull this, so that it moves that rod out like this. So there's a muscle, I wish I had a laser pointer, but... There's the sternothyroid muscle that pulls back, and there's a bottom jaw muscle called the medial, medial genohyoid 
that pulls it. So the whole thing goes like this, like that. And when it does that, it pulls, pushes that rod forward to get that antoglossal process ready to shoot, okay? So they have to, that whole thing is an apparatus that moves the tongue sort of out and getting ready to fire or pulls it back in. You know, I'm not going to quiz you on it, but I'm really, really thankful for biologists that look at all of these details to show you that even something we just go, oh, it's just a lizard sticking his tongue out, you know. There's just amazing engineering, and actually engineers can copy stuff, and they do all the time. It's a whole different branch of science called biomimicry. Biomimicry, there's engineers that basically go, you know, nature is smarter than us, and let's copy it, because none of it is patented. God did not patent it. Weaponry of the cone snail. The cone snail is an amazing little creature. It's a mollusk, and you'll see their shells often on windowsills of beach homes. <laughs> you know, there's little assorted shells on bathrooms, windowsills of beach houses. Anyway, the cone snail is quite an amazing little mollusk. Um, let's see if you see. Okay, I didn't show any of them. You can kind of see, I'm sure you've seen those shells. They extend their worm-like proboscis. Um, and that proboscis lures prey near, usually a small fish. When the prey attempts to feed on the proboscis, it fires a radular tooth. And you can see that radular tooth sticking out of the proboscis there. It's basically a little harpoon. Very different than most snails that <clears throat> just have this rasping tongue that rips stuff off. This is a, sh a harpoon. <clears throat> and then, so this is a dissected, a dissected mollusk showing you <clears throat> the proboscis up there in the, um, in the white box. There's the proboscis and there's the dart mounted in it. And then it goes into the uh, esophagus, which leads back to the stomach. And then there's this um, bulb gland, which has got all these toxins in it. And when it, it usually pre, that, that bulb gland squeezes and um, pushes all this poison up this duct into the pharynx, into the throat, up into the proboscis and loads that dart with venom. Loads the dart with venom. The, the dart is uh, off to the right there and it's an electron micrograph of the dart. It's got two barbs to prevent prey escape. It's got a razor edge and it's hollow and it's loaded with venom, and when it's fired, the bulb gland again contracts. It's preloaded um, th through the poison duct and the pharynx and then the radular canal. The conotoxins are the, the venom, are, and they're peptides that are specific for neuroreceptors of its preferred prey. Because if you're a slow-moving mollusk, and you're going to shoot a fish, you need that fish down fast because you don't want to be going for a ride over 100 yards of coral reef before the fish slows down. Um, so it just immediately paralyzes the fish when it shoots it into the mouth when the fish came up to nuzzle the proboscis going, oh, is this a worm to eat? Wow! And then it's dead or paralyzed. And then, it, and then it just swallows the fish, see that lower picture, just swallows this little goby uh, tail first there. Doesn't have to be tail first. And, um, and then in, it engulfs the fish and then digests it and sometimes regurgitates all of the undigested remains out the mouth. The, but it shoots the dart, it's lost. But they've got a quiver 
See that radular sac below? That radular sac's got a bunch of darts in it, like a quiver of arrows. And so when they fire one, they just, there's muscles that pull out another dart and cha-ching and reload the magazine. This is just a little mollusk about that big. It's amazing. So in conclusion, the chief end of man, obviously, is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. But we sometimes think that biology is just this dry body of facts. And we often teach it as a dry body of facts. Like, this is a curriculum. I hate that word. Curriculum. No, that's okay. But just, it's, this is what we're going to teach you, and you have to know it. But we need to teach it in such a way as to point people to God. I want it to usher them into a deep, I mean, just not, again, it's not canned, it's not forced. It's like you want to connect it with God designed this. God made it. God wrote it into the genes, four-letter alphabet. And he's, they built all this stuff from one cell. A zygote, remember? We all were a zygote. The snails were a zygote and everything. And so, um, therefore, to observe living things in detail is a worthy pursuit if it brings glory to God. If it's just an end in itself, well, nothing should be an end in itself. But if it's done to bring glory to God, then it's something that's worthy of pursuing. I mean, everything, we know that from the Reformation, everything um, is a lawful, I mean, if it's lawful before God, then it is, um, it is something that pleases God if it's meant to bring him glory. Now, don't overthink this when we see the amazing genius of God by seeing the elegance, complexity, and teleology. What's teleology? Big word. So <clears throat> it's the explanation of a phenomenon in terms of the purpose they serve. Evolution doesn't like to talk about teleology. They just say it's selected for in natural selection. But no, it was designed with a purpose. It was designed with a purpose down at the microscopic, even the molecular level, and it is even the simplest things have amazing complexity. So that's all I have for this evening. Thank you. Did you want? So if y'all could be thinking of questions, I have a couple to start with while we're moving this. First of all, we want to apologize to our the live stream audience for being a little late. A friend of mine, the late great artist Glenn Kennedy, said he could always find, he never had to look for the gate for Monroe when he was going through Dallas or Atlanta. He would just listen to the word place where people were talking the most. So, <laughs> And that's where it would be, so sorry about that. But uh, thrilled, that, that was fantastic, Gordon. Uh, Thank you. I wanted to start with a couple questions, meta questions, of titles. So, Riot in the Dance, where did that title come from? Um, <clears throat> when I was trying to name my textbook, I just wanted to name it um, to, well, I wanted it to look like not a typical textbook. So, that kind of weird title, which the publisher said, you need to explain it in the introduction. So, in short, Riot just refers to the fall. Um, when we look at nature, there's a lot of riot out there. We saw that in riot water, riot earth. You see, you know, lions t taking down hyenas, disemboweling their prey while they're alive. You see the giant water bug, very disturbing, uh, especially when you look at it close up. That's the riot. It's uh, Romans 8, uh, all creation groans. It was subjected to futility um, by him who subjected it. Um, 
And that's the riot. But also, it's a dance because um, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen from what has been made. So even though we see a broken, fallen world that's distorted by the curse, we see the, the, the dance. The dance refers to the, the, the beauty, the symmetry, the elegance, the, uh, the choreography of life. You can see it most obviously in, in when you see birds, various birds doing courtship dances. Um, there, but there's lots of other dances that are, um, you can, whether it's at the ecology level of the dance of courtship behaviors or uh, going down to the molecular level and you're seeing um, mitosis and meiosis and the microtubules hauling chromosomes around the cell. It's just like the postage jig. I mean, <laughs> there's a dance going on in, in the cell. It's all purposeful, and the postage jig is not, but other than <laughs> fellowship, but um, it's purposeful. It's a dance. Um, and even at the ecosystem level of the cycling of nutrients, the carbon cycle, the nutrient cycle, the water cycle, I mean the uh, nitrogen cycle, all of those things, at the big scale, at the medium scale, at the small scale, there's dance, and it all declares the glory of God. And evolution has been telling us for 160 years that there is no dance, because dance means that there's a choreographer. That's, that's one of the... I, this is a book that changed my life as a field biologist. Uh, a different shade of green, you mind commenting? And the subject, a biblical approach to environmentalism and the dominion mandate. Um, that was something I was, inter I'm interested in two main times, besides natural history, is creation evolution. That's, that's one of my um, topics of interest. I do a lot of speaking on. But the other is just the whole stewardship thing, because you have crazy environmentalists um, that are really out there, and you just go, well, I don't want to have anything to do with that. If you're a conservative Christian, you just go, that's just way over the top, and these Gaia-worshipping nature lovers, if, that's, if they love nature, then... I guess I should hate it. <laughs> no, that's overreacting. But because they worship nature, it can leave a bad taste in their mouth. But they, they're idolizing something that's not meant to be an idol. Um, it's meant to be, it's, we're to thank God for it, but it's not to be idolized. And so the environmentalists have gone too far with it, with a wrong, totally wrong ideology, totally wrong worldview, but then you've got people falling off, to, Christians falling off two sides of the boat. You've got Christians that go, well, if that's what they like, then I don't want anything to do with it. Um, <clears throat> you know, the kind of mentality that, you know, I see in a sign on the backside of a logging truck that says uh, Spotted Owl Mobile Home, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, that sentiment. Um, <laughs> whereas... Then you get these undiscerning Christians who go, oh, it's cool to be green. It's cool to be green. I'm going to be hip, and I'm going to drink the Kool-Aid of all of this crazy secular environmental nonsense. And so you get Christians sucked in that way, and you get Christians reacting against it all. And I'm like, we need a biblical... We need somebody that's saying... Let's just go to the scriptures and see what the Bible has to say about creation. And so that's why, that's why I wrote it. I, and I gave a little talk at NSA at that grad forum one year, probably in 2017 or something. And one of my colleagues came up to me and said, you need to write a book. <laughs> Thank so, God you did. Thank you so, so much for that. Yes. Like, you, you're referring there to the to protecting the biodiversity that God gave us. Can you explain on that a little bit? Yeah, just in short, um, uh, right at the beginning of, Gen Gen well, Genesis 1, 
answer is in Genesis. Genesis 1 says, um, God, at the end of the creation week, he said, God saw all that he had made. What's that mean? All that he had made. And said it was very good. So that was basically after he made all life, plants, animals, and he said, all that he had made, it is very good. So that was God's self-evaluation of his creation. It was very good. And I think we as Christians need to have our um, values in line with that and say, all of it's good. You say, wait a minute. No, it's not. There's all sorts of bad, bad stuff out there. Yes, you say the fall. And the fall was where so many creatures became predators or parasites, and we, we've just got to deal with them. We need to just kill them all. <laughs> you know, well, nobody, lions kill things, right? Nobody wants to make lions go extinct. Well, lions eat people. Nobody wants to make lions go extinct. You know, some lions eat people. But the thing is, dominion means we, we exercise dominion in a fallen world, which means you control pests. It's not wrong to kill termites, and it's not wrong to kill cockroaches if they're in your home. But a lot of things, and this is just real quick, but um, there's a lot more to say about this, but these creatures in Noah's ark was before or after the fall? It was after the fall. And what was Noah to be, what, what was Noah told to do? Bring on every land-dwelling creature on the ark. Well, if this is a good time for pest management, this is a real good time for pest management. Just have certain critters not invited. But God said, bring them all. And you guys, it's the glory of God to conceal the matter. It's the glory of kings to search it out. You guys figure it out. You guys figure out how to manage this fallen world you're in. And a lot of times when things become pests, pest plants, pest animals, it's, you know why? A lot of it, well, part of it's broken. We live in a broken world, so um, we're up against it. But a lot of the pest status is because of bad dominion. Our own abdication, when, I mean, it's just true. When, when we abdicate our responsibility, we get pests. Because we're do, either inadvertently just managing things badly, and then all of a sudden we're just up to our earlobes in some kind of pest, and it's partly our own lack of knowledge of what's going on. But I think as we learn more about ecology, learn about the balance and, um, you know, like certain biological control agents bringing in parasitic wasps to control crop pests, there's all sorts of th things that we can use to sort of maintain the balance. I'm not saying it's going to be utopian until the Lord redeems it all, but we can use our noggins and our love for God, love for creation, to start working towards getting things in control. And I think God will bless, bless obedience. But he's not giving us the answers. We have to figure it out in our dominion responsibilities. And he's not a perfectionist in the sense that he knows we're going to make mistakes. We'll try our best to control this, and oops, oh, that's not working, and oops, that's not working, and we'll figure it out. It's trial and error, but we're, we're still responsible. So that's, sorry, that took a little longer. Than that was great. I, again, but, um, yeah, so should we... Or you want to? Oh, no, I, I think there are a couple of questions in the audience. I just wanted to say how much uh, Lauren and I's our work on the ivory billed woodpecker. We have the same, uh, <clears throat> you know, we, we can't let that go extinct because of the wise dominion that was given to us by God. So, thank you for uh, mm. really drilling down with that. Thank you so much. Are there questions? I think I saw. Go ahead, sir.
I, let me, I'll translate that Charles is from England, so for the... Oh, well, I'm also, <laughs> no, I also don't hear very Charles much. made a great uh, point that God makes things unique. So when we manufacture things, you know, they are all the same. But even with, with, even with types, what, what's your approach to that, that God figures in these unique uh, qualities to even, even individuals of the same kind? Oh, just making things, yeah. What's, what's amazing is, Good question. yeah, God just gave so much individuality even within. Uh, we look at a field guide and we think, okay, all birds of that species need to look exactly like that. There's just so much. Is that the, am I yeah. getting on? Yeah, I think that, um, Charles, yeah, is, I think that's answering that. It, God just made so much variation. So um, in part of the dominion, I think, of all that he had made. Well, going back to the ark, um, the ark was the big, to put it in modern parlance, the ark was the biggest biodiversity conservation act in the history of the world. <laughs> and God wiped out most of humanity and was saving all sorts of animals at the same time. <laughs> so it was the biggest judgment in the history of the world, and it was the biggest biodiversity conservation act in the history of the world. And some people say, well, there's created kinds, and if created kinds are huge, like, uh, the, which I don't think they were huge, some do, but um, like the cat kind, well, the cat kind's got many, 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 many species, and some people might say, well, you only need to save a couple species from that kind and you're, you're doing good. It's like, no, I think God has got this huge kaleidoscope, not only within a species where you've got this huge genetic variation within one species, but you've got this huge, huge diversity within each group, like cats or dogs or bears. And, um, and so we, we can't just go, oh, Let's just indiscriminately throw things under the bus. So I think it's just, I'm not, I think sin is too strong a word, but I, I sometimes think um, it's more of a, it's more of a, a consequence of just bad dominion. If we, if we let something, if we just don't care two hoots about whether something goes out, um, if, if, yeah, so um, I know I'm not answering that specific that, question, but um, I, I just glory in God's diversity. Um, and I think a lot of us would just like, well, as long as there's cows and sheep and chickens, I'm good. <laughs> because it feed my little fat face. Right, right. It's like, well, God, most of the animals out there don't have practical, don't have any direct practical application to us. And for some reason, God made them. So I figure we have to maintain the inventory. Good. Yes. Go ahead. What do you mean by creation? Oh, just what do I mean by it? Yeah. So just for, so the, the uh, question the was. The creation evolution controversy, that's one of my areas of interest so I'm obviously I'm a fire breathing creationist but but, but I I've, I've had to I've been trained in evolution so I know their I know their wiles I know their paradigm I know what makes them tick and evolution may masquerade as a science as, as this objective science but it's really trying to undermine the whole belief that was it's just, it's trying to replace God. It's saying, we, um, Darwin, a lot of people just add God to evolution, but Darwin's goal was to just get God to be um, an unnecessary, uh, unnecessary in the whole process that we can explain our own existence and the existence of all life through random processes. And it's, it's, it's couched in scientific language, so people say, no, I'm not anti-God, I'm just believing science, and God is irrelevant. And um, as, a, as a Christian and as a biologist, um, my, 
my my bucket list goal besides declaring God's glory in creatures is to take evil I mean I'm not the person um, I'm just a pawn in the in the chess in the chess game but as a pawn I'm I'm wanting to do everything I can to get the Darwinian king in checkmate Amen. I, w- I want I want Darwinism to come crashing down in my lifetime, and I want it to be not a slow, graceful <laughs> r- removal. I want there. It's just me, but I want <laughs> it to be a Haman moment. Amen. I want I want all Darwinists everywhere to just go white yep. as a sheet and be. Of like Haman, you know, when the tables were turned on Haman and the gallows he built for Mordecai were going to be for him. I want every evolutionary biologist to have a Haman moment. I, I That's did, just my personal. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's shared, but uh, <laughs> just my personal view. I, you know, I do think it comes down to the Church of God or the Church of Darwin. Uh, you, echoing this, you said in your book, uh, much of what scientists say isn't factual at all. Often it is their opinions based on highly tenuous assumptions riding on the ethos of their scientific credentials. I think, again, there, there's so much of that that we're raised rather than the schools, and you've really pierced that with this. Again, different shade of green. Really think, read it. Peter, did you have a question? Yeah, go ahead. Well, I, yeah, I, I did. I, I was being trained up, I don't know, like Daniel in Babylon. Uh, I, was, I was being trained up, but I, I was like Daniel. Uh, I knew where my loyalties were. A lot of people imbibe it. So you have to be careful that when your kids go off to behemoth state, that they don't get seduced by the dark side. Um, and, but I took my test because it takes too long to say, according to evolution on the essay, um, I just, they knew where I stood. They knew that I was a creationist, but I wanted them to know that I knew what they thought. And so I was going to write my answers according to this is what you think. And, and, and then get my degree, and then go fight them. Uh, <laughs> what, one of the most profound things I've heard Gordon say this morning, we were on. We I'm were nice out. about it. <laughs> <laughs> we were out in the woods. I, we were talking about the craziness of many scientific propositions of late. And I asked Gordon, what do you think that is? And he said, oh, well, that's because humans are herd, H-E-R-D, animals. Oh, he's exactly right. So they, we're really good at figuring out where the, the, the majority the of the herd is. And those who, who think like that are impervious to reason and data. Right. So that's why it's so, so important for us to create a yeah. relationship across churches, uh, right. to stand up for what we believe, to model that. Because if you, would look, you look at our secular culture, there's, there's very few models of that. So we, it's time to stand up for what we believe yeah. in that regard. I mean, you think of the, the bug's life scene at the end, you know, where the ants figure out, hey, we outnumber the grasshoppers. Amen. And actually, there's more people who believe in God, but we are cowed like the ants in bug's life. Um, we think those are the big, big scientists. They, they've got the PhDs. They know everything. And we just, yes, um, we won't believe what they do but, or say, but we'll just be sort of um, obsequious. And we need to um, sort of reach a critical mass 
And once that critical, I mean, we all are herd animals. We are too. And, um, but the, the herd instinct goes for just about everything, whether it's uh, believing in evolution. Um, it, they're not engaging with the arguments. They're just saying, what's the majority? What does the majority consensus say of science? And I'm going to go with the majority because I might lose my job. I might not get tenure. I might not get a grant. I might just, it's like you just go with the flow. Don't bother me with the arguments. I'm not going to even, inter, I'm not going to even uh, interact with the arguments. Just going to say, you're anti-science. Stay away from me. Unclean, unclean. Um, so we, we need to realize that people are herd animals. It's not like they're really thinking through. It's the same for evolution, same with climate change. It's just go with the, go with the majority. And we need, as Christians, to be thinkers. Um, not, I, I don't want to tell you what to think, but just be immersed in the word, marinate in the word, know the word, and don't, don't try to accommodate the, um, the secular, because it's easy for Christians to just sort of hitch their wagon to um, that they did that with evolution, they've done it with so many things, it's like I don't have the emotional energy to stand against the current or stand against the, the consensus, so I'm just going to rework my hermeneutic and make the Bible say what the secularists are. Yeah, and especially in this age, increasing age of social validation rather than truth. Again, we really need to stand for, for the truth. Um, unless there's any other questions, I thought we'd wrap up so we can... Uh, end Dr. on w time. End on time. And Dr. Wilson will be, we'll have a reception afterwards. You can come visit with Dr. Wilson. It's really appreciate y'all. Thank you for so, coming. Thank you for coming. It's been a great night. Thanks, Dr. Wilson. Thank